Good morning and welcome to the First Congregational Church of North Brookfield. Everybody happy to be here? All right, God's happy that you're here. We have a couple of anniversaries that we're gonna celebrate. Don and Mona, they're uh, 57th, as I told, wow. And uh, so we've got a couple, so we're not gonna try and throw all those names in there. This will sound like we're singing in tongues, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but Rick and Linda also celebrated their 50th anniversary as well. So that's really cool. So we're just gonna say uh, fellow Christians. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, fellow Christians. Happy anniversary to you. God's blessings. God's blessings to you. God's blessings to you. God's blessings, fellow Christians. God's blessings to you. So I wanted to start today with a really special song because it came to me yesterday as a well, I guess they're kind of neighbors. Was walking down the street pushing a, a, a stroller and she was singing. And uh, it was Give God the Glory, Glory, Children of the Lord. And she's probably sitting right over there and not even listening to a word I'm saying. But so it was pretty cool to see her pushing the, the carriage through the neighborhood. That was your mom, if you wonder. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So it was like a little episode out of Disney when Disney was still clean and pure. <laughs> So join us, stand up on your feet if you're able, and we're going to sing some praises.
You'll feel the change, my child, when you come to the well. Be seated. Good morning. Just a, a few announcements before we jump into things. Uh, Sunday school for our kids starts on September 18th. What we are asking parents to do is to register your children right here in the parlor uh, between the service and going to Fellowship Hall. Just register so that we have all the information that we need. Um, there's going to be two classes, uh, ages four through second grade and grades three through sixth grade. And um, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be registering. But, but please uh, stop if you're a parent. Uh, stop and, and register your child. That would be great. Um, as you are registering your child or watching people register your child, keep walking through. We have dinner every Sunday in Fellowship Hall uh, right after the church service. Speaking of food, we have our men's breakfast on Saturday at 8.30. It would be great to see everyone there. Next Sunday is our rescheduled uh, baptism service, and hopefully no more you know, reschedules. The water will be getting cold. Um, so next Sunday is our baptism service at 2 o'clock. It's at the Sweeney's residence out in, it's Brookfield or West Brookfield? 
West Brookfield. Um, and everyone's welcome to come, so uh, check the newsletter for details on that. This is the first Sunday of the month, and so we have these envelopes that are in your pew called Christian Aid. This is a fund that the deacons use uh, to uh, help people in the church and in the community for, for various needs, and uh, this fund is funded by you on one day a week, I mean, sorry, one day a month, Communion Sunday. So when you put your offering in, if you feel inclined to, to give, just put something in there, or just write in your memo field the amount of money that you would want to go to Christian Aid. Okay. Um, next week, next week we are back to a 10.45 start time. <laughs> For those... <laughs> and other people are saying, no. <laughs> And that started the division in the church. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. I, for one, appreciate the extra time to tweak my slides and everything in the morning. But um, next week, for those that, that come late, this is not your week to come late. You know, you want to be here on time. Okay. We have a, our prayer email. Everyone pretty much knows that, but if you're new, we have an email, prayer at firstchurchnb.org. You can send prayer requests uh, during the service or anytime, and it will be forwarded to people to uh, be praying. Uh, right now, we are taking prayer requests that um, are urgent in nature or, or need to be shared with our community. Um, if it's not that, then just send an email to prayer at firstchurchnb.org. Um, requests that I already have, uh, we want to just continue to be praying for Heather and uh, Bob Downey. Uh, Sue Joy's mom, Marion, uh, passed this uh, week, and so please be praying for Sue Joy and her family. Uh, her mom has been on hospice for quite a while. Yes? Speaking of Sue Joy, she came into the pantry while we were there Thursday, and she took me by the shoulders, and she said, you are to stand up Sunday and say to Thank you for all the prayers for my mother. They have been answered. Oh, awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we want to be uh, continuing to pray for Holly Smith. She's now on hospice again, and uh, we want to be just continuing to lift her and Jeff and the family up in prayer. Um, Jack and Judy's daughter-in-law's mom uh, has had real heart problems for a while, uh, complications that led to a month-long coma. She's having a heart surgery on Thursday, and this is a life-or-death type of surgery. Uh, so we want to be praying that they can repair her heart and uh, lifting her up in prayer. And uh, Karen uh, Bassett, a family that she's ministering to through the cancer care ministry, has asked us to be praying for a woman in town. Her name is Ursula and her daughter. Uh, Lena, uh, Ursula has stage four cancer and she's uh, dealing with that right now. So we want to lift them up to you. Other requests that we should be uh, made known or praying about? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so our daughter-in-law, Katie, is uh, due today. This is her due date. Um, so a grandson soon to be uh, brought forth. Uh, but we do want to be praying for Katie that they plan to uh, induce her probably this week if she does not uh, go into labor herself. Um, yes. For a new. No, no, no. No, C. Okay, gotcha. Um, and that's. I, did I hear to Okay, next Wednesday. Great. We are praying for that. And, and so good to see you. Um, other requests um, before we go to prayer? Okay, so let's pray and... Oh, yeah? Oh, I didn't see, sorry. First name, Mark. Thanks. 
Gotcha. I'll just leave the letter off. Thanks. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you for being our comforter and our, and our healer. And we lift up to you, uh, Lord Bob and Heather, and we pray over them. We ask you to, to fight the cancer that Heather has with her. Lord, we pray for uh, Sue Joy and for her family. We rejoice at the calling home of her mom, Marion, and, and we just lift the family up to you right now. Lord, we continue to pray for Holly, and we just ask you to comfort her for your will to be done and for you to be with, uh, with her, Jeff, and, and family. And Lord, we, we pray for Lynn uh, and we pray for her surgery coming up on Thursday. We ask that your grace would be abundant. Lord, that she would be able to have her heart repaired. We just lift her up to you, Lord. Lord, we pray for Ursula and uh, her daughter, Lena, we pray over Ursula's cancer and we pray over the care that Lena is giving her and we just ask you, Lord, to be present in their lives. And Lord, we thank you for Liz, that she is here beaming and smiling and we pray over her appointment coming up at Dana-Farber and, and we pray with her, no see, just Jesus and Christ, that see. And we just lift her up to you, Lord. And Lord, we pray for Marsha's friend with uh, difficulties, renal failure, liver, and uh, we just ask that you would comfort her, heal her, speak into her life. Lord, we, we pray for all of the things that are not mentioned, but yet are deep within us. And we pray over this service, Lord, that, that your spirit would be present with each of us, that your spirit would challenge us and transform us, that your word would speak to us. Uh, Lord, we pray that that word, that spirit would empower us to serve you well in this kingdom. And we pray over our worship this, that it would continue here in this service, worshiping you through word, through song, through our prayers, through our offerings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So when I was uh, traveling out to a retreat uh, on the college uh, campus side of things, a staff retreat, Nate uh, and I talked all the way out, we talked all the way back, and I shared with him some of my thoughts of a, of a new kind of mini-series that will probably be a, more than many, um, not that anyone is surprised. And, and I told them, you know, about it and how it, you'll see as we go in, but how I'm going to spend some time on introductions. And as I shared, you know, some of my, my vision of where we would go, uh, Nate said, well, maybe the title of your first sermon should be an introduction to introductions. And so, uh, Credit given, uh, introduction, an intro to the intro. So this morning I just want to start out by talking about, sharing about two stories that you probably already know, two stories that you are most likely to already be very familiar with. And, and what I'm going to ask is that you just think of it a little bit differently, think of it a little more deeply, let it be more introspective, let it read you more. Um, two stories. The first story begins in the upper room. The, the term the upper room is, uh, is where Jesus had 
uh, the Last Supper in this upper room. And then it seems as though, whether it's the same one or not, but after the resurrection, uh, after Jesus has been crucified, the morning, the evening of the resurrection, they're gathered back into this place called an, an upper room. And here's what we find in John chapter 20. I, I know you've heard the story, but I, I just want you to let it, let it be new to you. He, here's the text. On the evening of that first day of the week, on the evening of that first day of the week, a, a Sunday, on the evening when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus, they have been traveling with Jesus for a period of three years. They had hopes that he was the Messiah. And all of their hopes, all of their dreams and visions seem to be crushed as Jesus is crucified on the cross, taken off, put into a tomb and a stone covering over it. And, and, and they're in this upper room, and, and at this point, Peter has seen the risen Christ, and yet he is still in this upper room. He's, he's, he's driven by fear of the, of the same fate awaiting them, that perhaps there's already, perhaps Judas who betrayed Jesus, perhaps Judas has given out all of the different names of all of the other key players. Perhaps, perhaps they are even being sought out at the very moment, and, and so here they are, they're, they're locked in the room. And I, and I imagine that some of them are talking about the miraculous things that happened uh, at Jesus' crucifixion and his death. When he died, the, 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 the curtain, this thick curtain in the temple is torn and ripped in two. That, that when he died, there was a major earthquake and some of the ground even opened up. And, and that when he died, Some of the dead arose out of their graves. And perhaps they're, they're talking about all of this. And, and, and Peter, I can just imagine Peter being sitting maybe over in the, on the side just going, what does this all mean? And, and, and doubting himself and being confused as to everything that's going on with, with this thought in his mind of, I denied him three times. And now he... He's alive, but he can't want anything to do with me. And, and so here they are. They're in this room. The doors are locked. They're afraid. They're, there's fear. There's confusion. There's despair. There's, there's hopes that have been crushed. There's doubt. There's all of these different things are floating around. They're in a locked room. And then Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, now John is writing this and John is saying the doors are locked and then Jesus appeared. The reason he's saying the doors are locked is for us to understand their fear and that no one unlocked the door. That, that somehow Jesus has appeared to them. Now imagine in this room they're all... They're all sitting there, standing there, hovering there in fear. And then they hear his voice saying, peace be with you. Imagine how you might jump backwards, how your neck might twist around, how, how your stomach might turn into, into gel. And in the same way that they thought that it was a ghost when Jesus was walking on water, they're, they're thinking, it's a, it's a ghost. How else can this be? Possible for the physical to manifest itself through these locked doors. And after he said this, he, he showed them his hands and his side. I'm not a ghost. Here's my hands. Here's my side. Does a ghost have a physical body? Here's my hands. Here's my side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord, and at, at some point, this, this confusion, this fear, this anxiety, this, this terror is 
evaporated as Jesus says, peace be with you. It seems as though peace came upon them. <laughs> and their fears turned to joy. They're, they're overjoyed at seeing the risen Christ. And so Jesus again says, peace be with you as the Father has sent me I am sending you. It's not over. What they thought was over was just the beginning. It's not over. And he is now saying, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. A common, common word for, a Greek word for send, is this word apostolos. Apostolo is the verb form that says to send. And so Jesus is sending them in the same way that he was sent, that, that he is giving them a mission in the same way that the Father gave Christ a mission. And man, does everything change at this. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. I just want you to take this in. I know you know the story, but just imagine the, the fear, the anxiety, the confusion evaporated and turning to joy and the mission. They're, they're called to go onto this mission. The Damascus Road, our second story. I know you know this story. This is the story where Paul, he's at this point called Saul, and he changes his name to Paul. But, but, but Saul is zealous for God, but blind to the mission. Zealous for God, but blind to the, to the mission. He sees this emerging church. He sees these people who have become known as apostles. And, and this is a term that, that, that is brought into play in the context of the early church. Before this, we see no real record of apostles being these leaders of something. And, and so these apostles are a threat to what Paul sees as the wholeness of God and his temple. And, and Paul is trying to snuff out this cult. And, and so Paul, the, the story is, you know, Paul stands in approval when Stephen, uh, a, a deacon in the church is being stoned, that Paul is, is there. Paul is involved in, in the murder of people who are connected to this new entity called Ecclesia, the church. Paul is trying to wipe it out. And, and here we find, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Murderous threats that he's actually already made good on. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Men, women, it didn't matter. If they were followers of what has become known as the way, he wants to get rid of them. And so he's on his way to Damascus. As he nears Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. 
So, so Paul is on his way to Damascus, murderous threats, letters to persecute and to take into his possession and bring back to Jerusalem men, women, and children who are believing in this new thing. A blinding light in the middle of the day. I mean, that, we can do that today with technology. But, but can you imagine a blinding light during the day at a time where the technology didn't exist to do this? At a time where a candle was the strongest power that you had? And imagine something blinding you, knocking you off a horse, and this voice calling from heaven. So, so Paul is knocked from the horse and he's told to go. Uh, and, and the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got from the ground, up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. Murderous threats. Knocked off the horse with the blinding light, completely blinded, and being led by the hand into the city. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, go to the house of Judas uh, not Iscariot, but go to the house of Judas on, the str on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. So he's praying. Been to Israel. I've been on Straight Street. It's still there, right there on the sea, the Mediterranean. Um, the Lord said to him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For so he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. So Ananias is well aware that Paul is murdering Christians, has letters to take them in, and he has a vision from God that I would say couldn't be true if it happened to me. I would be thinking, no, no, no. I must have it wrong. So, so Ananias is being told there's a guy named Saul, yeah, he's the murdering guy that's killing everybody, uh, but I've already told him that someone with your name is going to come to him. Boy, I would not want that message. And so here we see this. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. He knows. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, I want you to understand the impact of this word, brother. Brother, the, the murderous, you know, dangerous person, letters to arrest us all, brother Saul. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me, sent me, so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. So he's filled with the Holy Spirit. We see something common. Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit. Paul is, receives the Holy Spirit. And when we sing Amazing Grace was blind, but now I see, it's referring to Paul. He was blind, but, but now he sees. I just want you to think, I know you know the story, but imagine how you would feel in Paul's position, being blinded, thinking that you were on the right track, and yet being blinded and knocked off of your horse, being spoken to, and, and, and for three days not eating or drinking, but probably praying and praying and praying. And then someone comes and says, uh, 
receive the Holy Spirit and, and he's filled with the Spirit and scales somehow like fall from his eyes. You know, and I, I just don't get it because Peter, Peter misunderstood the mission too. Peter, Peter, when Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem, Peter said, let it not be. And, 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 and Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You have the, the thoughts of man and not the thoughts of God. And, and so Peter is like misunderstanding the mission. Peter falls asleep in, in the garden. He can't stay awake. He, he falls asleep in, in the garden. Peter, you know, misunderstands the mission. And then the garden of Gethsemane takes out his sword and cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. And Jesus says, no, that's not, that's not what we're about. That's not what you're doing. And, 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 and Peter goes on and, and denies him three times. And I just can't figure out why would God choose Peter to be one of his sent ones, to be one of his apostles. Why would, why would God choose Peter? Why would he, why would he choose to, to send, to, to be for an apostle? Why would he choose Paul who approves of Stephen's death and his murderous threats and letters to snuff out the very thing that has been started after the resurrection? Why would, why would, why would God involved Peter, and, and why would he involve Paul? And yet they were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Eyewitnesses to the resurrection, and that they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why? Why would God do that? And then I start asking the question, um, what, if, what if there was a way for Jesus to continuously get into the locked areas of our lives? We all have them. We all have areas of our lives that we have locked doors to, that we don't give access to. What if Jesus were to <laughs> just show up into those areas and, and speak words of peace into those areas? What, what if Jesus could actually appear in the midst of our locked in anxieties, fears, troubles, turmoils, shames? What if Jesus was able to enter into those locked areas of our lives and, and transform us and give us peace and give us the gift of his spirit? What if he was actually able to do that for us today? What if there was a way to continuously know if you're fighting against God? What if like Paul, you know, who in all of his zeal was actually fighting against God? What, what if some of us in the ways in which we conduct ourselves in the name of Christianity, in the name of Christ, what if there are ways that we ourselves are being destructive and, 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 and creating obstacles to God's plan. I think I find myself in that place often. What if there's a way that we could continuously know if we were working against God? What if there was a way for us today to continuously know if we were working against God? And, and what if there was a way for us to continuously experience the reality of the resurrection and his Holy Spirit? What if there was a way that we could, us today, experience what the apostles experienced, and, and a resurrection confidence, an experience of the reality of the resurrection? What, what if we were able to understand that more deeply, more real, 
than we've ever experienced before. What, what if it was more real to us? What if it, what if it actually became real to those that it's, where it's not real? What if we truly were able to have and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to tell us when we are opposing God's plan, to tell us when, when, when we are struggling with anxieties and depression and all of these things in our locked up rooms? <laughs> what if? What if it were true? What if? Paul, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, um, a, a church that seems to be doing really well. Four times in this letter, Paul writes about his joy, about how they are exercising and living out their faith. And, and Paul writes this in chapter 2, verse 13. And we also thank God continually is that word continually. We thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, when, when you received this message that, that you received from us, when you received the message from the ones who were sent, the apostles, when you received this message, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God which is at work in you who believe. I want you to focus your eyes as though somebody drew a red line right under the text. The Word of God, which is at work in you who believe. The Word of God, which is at work in you at work in you, at work in you. When, when we think that, that God is not there, when we think that, 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 that religion is dead, that Christianity is dead, when, when, when the world doesn't recognize what's going on, could it be? Could it be that we've gotten to a place where the word of God is no longer at work in us? So I ask the question, can, can you confidently say that the Word of God is at work in you? Is God's Word at work in you? What does that mean? How can that be? Has the word lost its place in you? Maybe, maybe you once could say that the word of God was at work in you, that, that, that you were living out your faith, not just knowing about your faith, living out your faith. It, but you've kind of slow burned out. And, and, and the Word of God is no longer really holding its place in you. Has the Word of God ever even been at work in you? You know, if you're thinking that the, that, that the church um, is just this place that you go to to hear someone talk longer than he should, <laughs> it's much, too many of you laughed at that. It's much more than that. Church isn't a box you check off. It, it is, it's so much more than that. And, and, and so where we're going with all of this, getting to the introduction of the introductions, where, where we're going with this is, I, I, I just thought as I was praying about what to do next, I, I found myself stumbling onto the different letters written in and the introductions to those letters. 
If you were writing a letter to someone who you really deeply loved and cared for, if you were writing a letter to them, would, what would you write in the introduction? Would the introduction be contextual? Would it, would it be based on what that person is going through or where that person is at? Would, would, would it be tailored or would it be cookie cutter? Would, you know, I, I think that you'd tailor an introduction perhaps. And, and if you were the reader receiving a letter from someone who, who loved you, cared about you, would you just like skip over the introduction? Because I think that's what I've done a lot of when I've read the letters is there's the introduction, blah, 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 yeah, introduction, and then you jump into the meat of it. But what if the introduction was actually a, a, a prologue to the rest of the letter? What if the introduction revealed something deeper? What if the introduction was something that would speak to us? So I want to spend some time looking at the introductions. Just real fast, just looking at some of the introductions from Paul that are longer. We, we see this in, in Romans. We see the introduction. We're going to look at the introduction. And, and, and interestingly, look at what's in the introduction. Paul called to be an apostle. We're going to talk a lot more about that term, the apostle. But, but Romans, Paul called to be an apostle and, a, and an introduction worth looking into. First Corinthians, an introduction worth list, looking into. And, and what do we see? Paul called to be an apostle. And, and when we look at Paul's letter to the Galatians, we see the introduction. But again, Paul, an apostle, sent. And, and, and then we see in, in Titus, uh, we see an introduction again, a longer introduction. And we see... Paul, an apostle of Jesus, and, and we see that out of nine out of 13 letters that Paul writes, he mentions uh, the fact that he's an apostle. Why? What exactly is an apostle? And, and, and why is Paul an apostle? He's a latecomer to the game. We're gonna look at, we're gonna look at all of that as we look at introductions. When we look at Peter and, and the, the two letters that, that Peter writes, interestingly, there's an introduction. In, in 1 Peter, we have an introduction. And look at what Peter writes, an apostle of Jesus Christ. When we look at 2 Peter, we see an introduction. We see an introduction. And what do we see? Paul, uh, uh, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Why is this making such a difference to the people who are reading it initially? And why should it make a difference to us today? Paul writes this to the Ephesians. He writes this. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. What if we received this spirit of wisdom and revelation ourselves to know him better? I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparable great power for us who believe. What if, what if we actually began to integrate into our faith the incomparable power that is given to us who believe. You know, they, they say that we only tap into a small percentage of our brain. Have you heard that? I think we're only tapping into a very small percentage of the power that God has made available to us. Lastly, that power that God has made available to us, Paul is saying that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Paul is saying that that power that transformed his life, that power that transformed Peter's life, that power that transformed the world, that power that 
is offered to us as a gift is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That power is available to us. <laughs> when are we going to start tapping into that? When are we going to start seeking that? And how do we do that? There is so much more to being a Christian in this thing that God calls the church. And, and as we move through these introductions, we'll, we'll see how valuable and important these letters were to the early church and are to us today. Could it be that Jesus is waiting to crash into those locked areas of our lives and transform us? Could it be that, that, that Jesus is, is wanting to reveal to us how we can work with him and not against him, that we can tap into the power, that same power that raised Christ from the dead to bring the light of the gospel to the world. Could it be that in the same way that Jesus sent the disciples, that he's sending us, that he's sending you, that he's sending me. As we prepare for this communion table, here I am, Lord, send me. May that be our thought, our reflection. Let's pray. Father, uh, your word available to us has the power to change us and to change the world. May we also be the sent ones. In your name we pray. Amen.
I just am amazed at the, the complimenting of, of the music to the message, the mir miraculous working power of his spirit. And, and, and that's what we've been talking about. <laughs> and, and, and here we are at this place, at this table, metaphorically at this point, at this table of communion, because of that power of the resurrection. And that power is available to us today. Can you grasp that? I can't. <laughs> I can't grasp that, that. That God would love us so much that not only would he die for us, but that he would invite us into a mission equipping us with this power from the Spirit and equipping us with the Word of Scripture. And, and, and I just want us, me, you, to recommit ourselves to the Scriptures, to, to this Word that can work in us, but you know what? It doesn't work in us if we're not ingesting it. And, and, and this is symbolic of that, that we are ingesting his body. It's, it's a symbol to us that we're ingesting his body to say, may your body, may your spirit that we receive empower us, feed us, sustain us. So when Jesus was being betrayed, before he was being betrayed in, the, in what we call the Last Supper, they, they broke bread. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. This bread is my body broken for you. That may we take together as a family this bread. Allow me to pray. Father, I pray over this bread and this cup that as we ingest it, we would be committed recommitted anew to ingesting your word throughout this next week to to requesting and calling upon the power of your spirit that you have given us lord may this uh, be the beginning a new beginning a deeper place for each of us in Jesus' name amen take an eat a cup, likely at the time that, um, that the cup of redemption, it was called, 
would have been raised. He would have, he would have raised this cup of redemption and he would have said, this, this wine represents my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. As a family in Christ, take and drink. Closing hymn is hymn number nine. Um, yeah. Oh, I do. Okay. <laughs> Please stand if you're able.
Our benediction this morning, I just wanted to repeat the verses that we looked at in Ephesians chapter 1. And Paul writes, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may he give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Father, I pray now, I pray for myself and I pray for each person here. I pray over our church. I, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would become more and more in us as we take more seriously your word and we take it in and allow it to work in us. May we go forward in grace and in power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.